Well, good afternoon uh, to the Alive Project. Is I'm Dr. Lurcher from uh, San Jose State uh, University School of Information, and it is my very distinct pleasure to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Deborah Fro Froggett. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Froggett, uh, introduce yourself and tell us about you your about. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lurcher, very much. Um, I am a recently retired school librarian. I started out in public libraries. I was a medical librarian for a while, and I have worked in six different school districts, Boston, of course, being my last. I worked in Boston for 17 years, 16 and a half years. I started out as high school librarian there, but I have worked at all three levels. Um, and that was the, I was at Boston Arts Academy and Fenway High School. They shared a uh, building, so I was a library director for both schools. And then seven years ago, I began my central office work. Oh, wow. And so what was your uh, title there? Or, oh, Director of Library Services for Boston Public Schools. Yep. All right. Okay. So one of the first things I understand you did was create a virtual learning commons for the whole district. Uh, talk to us about that. <laughs> what is it and how, how did you do it? Well, delightfully so, because I've heard you, Dr. Lurcher, present and have read about virtual learning commons. And when I began, some some of the schools had, or some of the school libraries had web pages, some didn't. Mm -hmm. And at that time, there were 25 uh, certified librarians and about 50 programs. And it basically stayed the same. But it was lots of inconsistencies. Some didn't have any web presence. And so I thought it would be great to apply a consistent model across the district, particularly because we have um, transient kids. And so when they go from school to school, they would see a similar model. And so they did you know, a lot of reading and so on. And then Aaron Knoll, who is the um, librarian at the Winship Elementary School in Boston, he co-developed the, the virtual learning commons with me. I mean, I started at BA Fenway applying it, but then we did um, branch out and apply it district-wide because it, I really believe it's a solid uh, model, and um, it, but it can be flexible. And so schools um, take the, the template that that basically you created Dr. Lurcher, we applied it, made a template and they can, the librarians can download that template and make it their own, but it has the elements of the, the virtual learning commons. And it, it's a pretty powerful tool. And now many schools, whether or not they have a librarian, jump on to get resources and, and, and so on. So I'm really grateful. And we're going to run those trainings again for the new library librarians this year, continue to I do that. I was going to ask you, uh, so what is the contents on that, on that template that then they can draw down and, and make it their school? What are the contents? Well, it, yeah. it has the, it has, um, sort of the five elements, the, the knowledge building, the, the, um, we call it information and research, the re like the reading, um, literature and reading. Um, we have a professional development area, huh. um, and and then um, I know there are five, but I'm forgetting them. But there, but those are all there, um, and so that template is there with those. And then the the dis or the statewide databases are all in the research oh, yeah. element, so that. Everybody can see those and use those. Um, but then the, the home page, the landing page has says virtual learning comments, but then there are pictures of each individual school and the school librarian and so on. And then our district one looks the same, but it has district pictures. But then there's information about the schools that people can go to and look at as well. So that was a, a, a real attempt, uh, first attempt to, to bring equity across all the schools. Uh, yeah. did, did, the, did the children and teenagers have access to computers? They actually do and did. 
we there was a study done in 2018 across Massachusetts, and though Boston fared pretty poorly on most everything, access to technology was pretty high. And uh, Chromebooks are pretty much everywhere. Yeah. We have a pretty robust tech department. Library services was sort of that lost child for a while, um, but we've grown back. So, but there was there was technology. Um, it, the the virtual learning commonses and the district commons virtual learning commons weren't used nearly as much in schools without librarians. But as I did professional development, connected with school principals and so on, right. people became aware of it. Sure. So that's excellent. And then the, I understand the next thing was to try to get credentialed uh, librarians in every school. Tell us about that, uh, uh, that project. I'm happy to do that. So when I began, as I mentioned, there were only 25 certified librarians and we have 125 schools. Wow. And it was about equitable access to what librarians do. The central office powers that be and human capital really did not have an understanding or cognizance of the school library impact studies and really what librarians do. I saw, I mean, this was a little bit later in my tenure, but many school librarians weren't evaluated at all. Or if they were, the evaluation said, does the book room well? And there was nothing about pedagogy. So I connected with the human capital department and, and said, we need to change this. This was six years ago now, or, or seven, six or seven. And they challenged me to show us the data, show us student learning impact on student learning in a quantifiable measure. So I put out to my school library team who would like to do action research and to take their performance evaluation and something that school leaders were observing and where there's a, a starting point for a student and then a, an ending growth point that could be measured. And so we performed these different action research projects and we went back to human capital and they saw that we mean business and that we know what we're doing. Right. And they now, uh, um, there was there, and it continues to be a school library teacher performance evaluation rubric that the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and the Massachusetts School Library Association developed together. It's dated, it was developed in 2009, but, um, it and it's not compulsory, but it's what we have right now, and it is now an element of the school librarians' performance evaluation um, process. And it's in our it's in our platform, our evaluation platform that Massachusetts uses as in a drop down menu, and so school leaders can go and use it for their school librarian. And we did this over the course of a couple of years, and now where the librarians are supposed to be. Again, it's not compulsory, but but the new librarians that we've brought on, that's the only thing their principals know because they've never had a librarian before. So we have the opportunity to tell them that this is what they must use. And so, uh, so after um, all of that um, and getting that recognition, the other thing we did was we wrote a pretty strong strategic plan. When I started, we wrote a, st a strategic plan from for 17 to 21, a five-year plan. Nothing happened. I was a broken record. I tried in all different ways to, to talk about equitable access and so on. Every now and then there'd be a glimmer of, of, well, maybe if you do this, you know, we'll add libraries or we'll, we'll take a look. But then this last strategic plan that we wrote in, um, 2021 and then it was passed the fall of 21 by the school committee was much stronger had data from the first strategic plan as well as this action research and performance evaluation it also talked about the virtual learning commons it also talked about a way to 
to measure student access. Um, it also talked, mentioned um, including a, a, a district-wide library advisory council. So stakeholders are involved in supporting libraries. And the superintendent was very pleased, the superintendent at the time, and it was passed unanimously by the school committee. And then at that same time, thanks to um, ESSER funding and ARPA funding, right. the resources necessary to expand libraries were going to be funded by that, but the district did make a commitment and they followed through to fund library positions over the course of five years or four years, basically adding 30, then 30 more, and then the final year, 20 more. And then we, along with the current librarians, the fourth year, that they would, those positions would be funded by the district and those positions are considered guardrails, so they could not be cut by a school principal. So oh. that strategic plan was really significant in laying this all out. And I, you know, I, I had a library team. I did not write it myself. We had team members, had um, nonprofit involved. We had actually uh, um, the Mac and Book Company sales rep who really has worked closely with the Massachusetts School Library Association. He supported that, you know, so we had a, different stakeholders and a school principal and a teacher so that the, we were all together writing this plan. Just incredible. <laughs> it is incredible. Uh, just a tremendous amount of work and effort. And uh, so, so what's ahead uh, so this is on, even though you uh, retired just a few weeks ago. Uh, yeah. So this is going to continue. Uh, describe how it's uh, uh, going to happen. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So just yesterday, I was I was at a Massachusetts School Library Association meeting, and one of my school librarians, um, Morgan Cohen, which you will be interviewing as well, she announced to the group that was meeting, because it, it was a strategic planning for the MSLA that I'm spearheading, there will now be a circular that principals have to read and sign so that they understand that they cannot use librarians in a specials or a class rotation, that they are independent and will have responsive schedules so that they see the students when they need to see them. And my line to school leaders when I was describing what a responsive schedule is, is that that library reaches every corner of the building the program. And this is a huge win. Um, and so it'll be much easier moving forward when we onboard the new schools that have not had a library program. And, and many of these new principals have never worked with a librarian so that they can't you know, assign that person lunch duty like some of it's happened a bit this year and, and we're, we're sort of fighting those battles but um it's it, it worked out pretty well but now they will be told explicitly that a responsive schedule is what they must strive to implement and then it's the school librarian's responsibility to show the data that they're doing that work right yeah so it's a balance of you must, but also demonstrate what's going to happen. So you're going to win, I think, uh, principles over as that. Is that, is that the plan? That's the plan. Uh, so, so your major recommendations to uh, uh, school districts that, that really want to have credentialed people at the buildings, uh, what's your advice? My advice is to first think about how librarians are evaluated, to strive to show the unique nature of the position. There are definitely rubrics out there that can be used. You certainly can find the Massachusetts School Library Association rubric to demonstrate value and that we are educators in our own right. And the, then the second piece, as I described, was the strategic plan. Right. Um, you know, different states require, have different um, 
right. requirements in Massachusetts, for instance, you can't apply for federal funding without a strategic plan. And that was sort of the reason why I did the first one because I wanted my librarians or the, my colleagues to be able to apply for small library services and technology act grants. And they couldn't do that without a district strategic plan or a school strategic plan. But um, we, you know, it's easier to have a district one. Um, and so just to lay out really what your vision is and to keep the plan student centered, equitable access for all students. Um, because in Boston, it was, and right now it still is pretty inequitable for about at this point, 40% of the students don't have a library. And, um, and so we're, you know, that's, that's the, um, the broken record that now I keep saying, you know, that song now keeps on playing and it will be finished in three years. So, um, and be persistent. <laughs> and what's ahead for you personally? Well, thank you. I am now, and I was actually last year, but it was sort of on the sly, the um, Massachusetts School Library Association Outreach Director. Oh. It's a consulting position and it's 20 hours a month, which is lovely. I attend the Massachusetts Library Association legislation, legislative committees meetings. We work on, <coughs> excuse me, legislative agenda and we are working with the Mass Board of Library Commissioners to ensure and strive to get legislation in place so that every school has in the, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has a librarian and a program with a responsive schedule and a budget across the state. And we're getting some traction. So that's, I'm excited about being able to get political now that I'm not a central office Employee. Well, watch out, Massachusetts. Here comes Dr. Froggett. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you bet. And what tell us the what is the bottom line to all of this? I mean, why why work and do all this effort anyway? Well, um, you know, it comes down to our students and building curiosity and building great readers. I, I I'm pretty convinced from my time, my 17 years in Boston, that students without libraries are less engaged when they come to a new school. I saw that at Boston Arts Academy Fenway High School, and that's what I did my dissertation on the informationally underserved. And I, I, I just, I can just the twinkle in a student's eye when they walk into a, a ribbon cutting of a new library and have that resource in the school. It, it just is, makes the school a buzz with literacy and, and, and learning and curiosity. And it really, it really comes down to that. And it's, you know, in a, in a big district, if some school students have that and some don't, there's a problem. With that. And so that's to me, the bottom line. Super. Well, thank you, Dr. Froggett, so very much for your wisdom and your your uh, abilities to really, uh, you know, uh, uh, work toward equity for for kids all over, uh, not just Boston, but uh, you know, across the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.